So here's the heart behind today's message and what I really feel God putting on my heart. You know, we live in a day where the Bible categorizes this day as the day of the Laodiceans. That's the seventh letter in the book of Revelation. Remember, Revelation is the story of the unveiling of Christ. Revelation means apocalypsis, unveiling. It's the way a sculptor may, you know, pull back the veil and reveal the beautiful sculpture and everyone's waiting for the unveiling. Revelation means, it doesn't mean Armageddon, um, you know, it means the unveiling of Jesus Christ in full glory. It's the story of the second coming. Christ came the first time as a suffering servant. He came the first time as a lamb to be slain for our sins. He's coming the second time as a glorious king. He's coming the second time as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the conquering lion. Revelation begins with seven letters to seven churches. And what he's doing is he's giving seven churches seven report cards. He's giving seven churches seven x-rays. If you ever just want to know where you are in your spiritual health, and just want to kind of, you know, before the LSATs or before the GMAT, you could take a practice test. If you ever just want to take a test to see where your heart is and know according to what the, the test will be as we give an account before the Lord for our service, because remember, salvation is a free gift, but we will give an account for our service, read the seven letters, download the Antioch Christian Fellowship app, and listen to the teaching that we did on the seven letters. But the thing is, those seven letters also are prophetic. Meaning if you take the church timeline and make it a railroad track, each of those seven letters are boxcars, and each boxcar represents a different age. So you actually see the beginning of the church with Ephesus. You see uh, the emergence of the Roman Empire and Roman Catholicism with the Church of Pergamos. You see Protestantism and then even dead Protestantism with the letter to Sardis. You see Philadelphia with the missionary movement and explosion of the gospel around the world with the letter to um, what comes after that, Philadelphia. And then finally is Laodicea. And then after Laodicea is the rapture of the church. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, after this I look and behold, a door was open and a voice said, come up. We are in that final boxcar. We are in that final letter. And if you want to go to Revelation chapter 3, please, I'd like to read from there. Revelation 3, and what's beautiful about scripture is that it explains itself. Uh, you don't have to sell it. The word of God is God's word. It's God's revelation to man. Um, and you don't have to sell it. You don't have to add anything to it. It reads clear. Uh, revelation chapter 3. Um, and let's go to um, verse 14. And if anyone needs a Bible, just raise your hand. They brought you guys the big ones. <laughs> okay. Let's read Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. It says, And unto the angel, which means the messenger. It's not uh, a celestial being, but it's angelos. It's the messenger. It's the lead pastor of the church. Revelation 3, 14. To the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. What does Laodicea mean? Laodicea comes from two different words. It comes from Dicea, which is where we get the word dictate, right? Um, and then we have the word leo, which means laity or congregation. It's ruled by the congregation. Thank you very much. Um, so Laodicea means rule by the congregation. What it basically means is the congregation is calling the shots, okay? Let's keep reading and then just let the day, you know, the word unpack itself, and then we'll see the day we're in. He says, these things says the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. It doesn't mean that Jesus is created. It means that he is the pioneer of all of God's creation because him being God made everything. He says, I know your works. He says, I know that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. What he's saying is when you're cold and you're cold-hearted to God, you know it. When you're hot and you're boiling, it says in, Revel in Romans 13, fervent, boiling like water for Jesus, you know it. He says, I'd rather you be cold because at least you know you need to change. I'd rather you be hot because at least you know you're hot. But he says, but because you are lukewarm. When you're lukewarm, you don't know what you are. 
and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And actually, the Greek word is, I will vomit you out of my mouth, right? The reason is this. It's similar to how God designed the human body. God's designed our body that when we eat food, right, when we ingest it, we digest it, and then we assimilate it. It spreads uh, throughout our entire body into every cell. He's designed our body that if something poisonous or we say something that doesn't agree with us goes into our body, our body's been designed to eject it. What he's saying here is not only is lukewarmness deceiving, but lukewarmness spreads. So the reason our body ejects something that's not good is so that it won't assimilate throughout our body. He's saying that he must vomit lukewarmness because if not, it will assimilate. And when it assimilates, what does it do? It creates more lukewarmness. So if someone sees someone on fire for the Lord, what does it do? It provokes them to be on fire for the Lord. But when someone sees someone just kind of, well, one minute they're in church, the next they're not. One minute they're in church, the next week it's spa day, the next week after that it's this, and it just kind of seems like church is just maybe fourth or fifth or whatever. Well, that spreads because now when your flesh uh, is laying in bed on a Sunday morning, uh, the first person you think of is how so-and-so took spa days. They seem fine. I mean, how many of y'all know your flesh will tell you anything to keep you in bed, won't it? Anything. Even tell you you might be dying. You might be dying. Stay home today, you know? I just got a weird feeling. I might die today. I just need to stay home and clean my house. Your flesh will tell you anything. But what lukewarmness does is it just spreads to the point where it just helps us justify what is just the opposite of Jesus. And the bottom line is the last thing we want to do or confess is that our, 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 our life would be the opposite of Christ's life, that we would just honor him with our lips and not with our hearts. So this is what he says. He says, first, this is what lukewarmness is. Now he says, this is what lukewarmness looks like. And if you want to begin with verse 17, first write in your notes, you know, self-satisfaction, uh, self-deception, self-reliance. Self-satisfaction, self-deception, self-reliance. He says, because this is what you say, and he's saying, this is what lukewarmness looks like. You say, I am rich, I am increased with goods, and I have need of nothing. And he says, and you don't even realize that you're actually wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And if you look at today's church where people are more concerned with the premises than the promises, more into what the premises and the building looks like and how the show goes on, you know, somebody's wisely said, every church is either feeding sheep or entertaining goats. Every church is either feeding sheep or entertaining goats. But in a day where people are more into the premises than the promises, that so underscores what he's saying here. Your statement is that you're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing because there is money in the bank, uh, because this day of just church explosions and churches seeming like they're just so huge. Some churches are a mile wide. Uh, but sadly, they're only an inch deep if they're not really teaching the word of God, you know. But he says, you're saying I'm rich and increased with goods and I need nothing. And he says, you don't even realize that you're really spiritually impotent and deceived. But like a physician, Jesus not only gives the malady, but he also gives the remedy. And that's what makes Jesus so amazing in any time of our life, right? Um, remember John the Baptist said, here comes one mightier than I. I'm not even worthy to unlatch his sandals and the ax will be at the root. He's saying there comes God in the flesh and he's going to always get to the root of problems. He's not just coming here to deal with bad fruit and bad branches. The ax will be laid at the root. He will get to the root of issues. And isn't that what he does as our wonderful potter and savior, right? He makes up, takes up his residence in our heart, and he just gets it to the root of issues with us. And he uses the word of God to get to the root of issues. And he doesn't just get to the root just to expose bad roots, but he brings remedy. And this is what he does here. He points to a church that's self-satisfied, self-deceived, where the congregation's calling the shots, where no one is wanting to listen to spiritual authority. That's what Laodicea means, right? I mean, and isn't that that day to day? You know, the pastor says, well, the Bible says this. And somebody says, well, I, me and five friends say this. And not only do we feel this way, but we feel this way so strongly that we're going to leave. 
And not only are we going to leave, but we're going to tell five more, and we're going to add some spice to it. You know what I mean? But it all comes back to what does the Word of God say? This is the day that we're in. This is the day that you're called to. But I want to tell you all something. The Bible still tells me in 1 Timothy 3, if any man desires the work of a bishop or an overseer, he, he desires a good thing. This is still a good thing. And I'm going to keep going. Let's go. So he says, as the remedy, I counsel you, I advise you to buy from me gold tried in the fire. He says, what you need is, you need your world shifted up a little bit. You need some refiner's fire. You need uh, basically to be shown how weak you are. Come to me, because what do you do with gold? You refine it. How do you refine it? How do you get the dross off of it? All of this self-deception, this self-satisfaction, this self-reliance, that's dross. So what's the only thing that removes dross from gold? You expose it to fire. But it's not a fire of judgment. It's a finer of refining fire. And how does the goldsmith know in ancient times when the gold, you know, when the impurities rise to the top through the heat and he skims them off? How does he know when it's been in the fire long enough? When he can see his own reflection in it. He's telling a lukewarm day like today, I still am the one who is inviting you to come to me. Let me refine your heart from a filthy world and from a backwards churchianity. Because what you're reading about here is churchianity at an all-time high. Do you all know the difference between following Jesus and churchianity? Do you see what's on the news? So much of what is depicted as the church is churchianity. You know how many people are out in the streets and want no parts of Jesus because they're stumbling at churchianity? We're the ones that are called to show forth the true Jesus. You know, a lot of people hate math. Raise your hand if you hate math. Be honest. It's all about honesty here at church. You hate math. All right, all right. Same people. How many of you had a math teacher that you didn't like? The same people that hate math, is it, was there a math teacher you didn't like? That's what I find. Most people hate math because they had a mad, bad math teacher, not because it's, it's, math is seamless. Math is beautiful. You hit that equal sign, you get this perfect number. Right? That one number and no other number in the universe. Math is perfect, but a bad math teacher can misrepresent math. You see, Jesus is perfect. The Bible is perfect. But bad teachers can cause you to hate the whole thing and throw away the baby with the bathwater. So he says, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. He says, so you may really be rich. The idea is you think you're rich because you have a lot of money in the bank. You think you're rich because uh, the church is all decked out. But I want you to be spiritually rich, right? And I counsel you to come meet for me for white raiment that you might be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness doesn't appear. And also I want you to anoint your eyes with eye salve so you may really see. And then I love this in verse 19. And this is for you guys to understand with our calling. When we talk to people like this, and when we read difficult portions of the Bible, this is a very sobering portion of Scripture, isn't it? It's all about the heart of God behind everything. He says in verse 19, I'm telling you this because I love you. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. I'm challenging you because I love you with an everlasting love. I have seven points. This throws me into the first one, which is the importance of knowing who God is. As a pastor, you have to know God because you will treat people, you will talk to people according to how you believe God is. But I'm, let me jump back into the word. He says, behold, verse 20, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. This church is so deceived that they think that Jesus is in the midst and they think they're in the middle of revival and Jesus is actually outside of the church knocking to be let back in. That is a day that we're in where people see the numbers and they see the lights, camera, and the action and they say, you know, this blessing has to be from God and only a short reading of scripture shows you that not everything big is from God, right? Eve gave birth to Cain and thought that he was the promised seed of the woman, only to realize he would be the wicked one known throughout all of Scripture. So everything that comes first and everything that comes biggest is definitely not always from God. It could just be a whole man-made thing. He's saying here, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, 
I'll come in and have an intimate meal with him and he with me. The Lord is saying that for the believer, for the church, no one, no one is ever at the place where they cannot start with personal revival all over again. And if you're here today, no matter where you are, to read this so often is to say, I am lukewarm, kind of like tag you're it. It's like, I'm it. I've been tagged by the word. Verse 19, one, if you're getting this today and you're like, wow, I haven't been to church in 800 years and I walk in and the first thing is, boom, I'm lukewarm. That is me. Verse 19, he's saying this because he loves you. Verse 20, he is knocking at the door of your heart and saying, I, anytime you want to let me in, we will have, I will sup with you. It means an intimate one-on-one -on -one meal. Verse 21, to him that overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. He that has the ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So I have seven points for you guys. And it's for you wives as well. And I know my wife took you guys out for lunch last Sunday, and you guys just had that time. And all of us have had that time. But you guys had some special time. Um, seven points. And this is for all of us to hear, because here's the reality. The Bible says that the pastor should be counted worthy of double honor. Double honor. What does that mean? Well, see, we live in a day with what the church does in showcasing its fallenness is whenever the church makes a correction, the church, if you study church history, you tend to see overcorrections. And that just points to our fallen nature. You know what I mean? Uh, you even do it in your personal life. You know, you decide you want to lose weight. So what do you say? Uh, it's not just a matter of cutting out bad things, you know, and eating healthy things. You overcorrect. You're just not going to eat. You're just not going to eat. You're just going to throw splashes of water on your face all day. You, it works for two, works for three days. Maybe you lose 10 pounds, but boom, you put it back on by, by the next Sunday. You know, it's an overcorrection. That's what happens. Well, what we see today is this. One, you have this Laodicea in a day where everyone, self has never been more charged and energized than today. You know, you can brand yourself. You can open five different Instagram accounts. You can have five different personalities. And then you could create filters for the other four. You could be five different people, 10 different people, and get business cards made and shipped to your house for all five. Self can be so empowered. So in a day like today, couple that with the fact that pastors have been known to power trip. Pastors who uh, use people as a means to an end. Pastors who don't come to serve like Jesus, but to be served. You know, it makes it easy to couple all of that and you create, quote unquote, this perfect storm of an overcorrection. Well, you know what? Uh, the pastor's not getting any honor. The pastor will just get honor like a brother, uh, like anybody else. We're all sinners, right? You know? But the Bible comes in and says this that the pastor watches for your soul. The pastor teaches you. There are a lot of people that teach you in this life. You go to the Apple store, someone teaches you, and, and they're pretty good there too, aren't they? I mean, you could go in there feeling like, you know, you're, 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 everything is lost, and they just say, hey, do this for me, do that for me, and do that for me, and, and everything's back again. You feel like, I forgot my password. Uh, I, it's so cryptic, no one will know it, and then they help you find it in two seconds. We're taught in a lot of places. The church is the only place where we go and where we're taught how to know God and how to walk with God, and how to walk with our maker, and how to receive the psychological, emotional, spiritual healing, how to have a blessed home, a healthy home, how to overcome odds and obstacles, how to deal with failure, failure, and how to live according to the gospel. And God put such a premium on the gift of his son that he has said, the man who is teaching you, my son, the man who is teaching you the precepts, the heart of my son, you will show the honor. You will show that you honor me by how you honor that person. I mean, the scriptures even says in 1 John, how can you say that you love God who you've never seen when you can't even love your brother who's right in front of you who you see every day, right? It doesn't mean that the pastor uh, is above anyone, but it says you respect the office. So it's not saying a pastor is better. Pastor could uh, actually just be, you know, I mean, just the biggest knucklehead in the room. 
But if the person is called by God, and if the person is walking in that office, you respect the office. Now you understand why David, even when Saul was trying to come after him and kill him, when David had the opportunity to kill him back, he wouldn't do it because he said, I respect the office of God. The office of God reflects the mind of God. You know, this is God's idea, you know? Say uh, you bring up an idea, you know, and I just, just stomp all of you. write the idea out on paper, and I take these big Timberland boots, and I just stomp all over your idea. Then I run out on the lot, make sure my boots get real dirty, come back, stomp all over the idea. Will that offend you? Yeah, because the idea is actually the thoughts of your heart. You see, the church is his idea that a, that a saved sinner would stand up and be called by God to teach is his idea. When we don't honor the idea of God, then we're really not honoring the thought of his heart and we're showing a dishonor for God. Do you all understand that? Now do you understand the importance of honoring a pastor? But we live in this Laodicean day where it's like the congregation calls the shots, where there's an overcorrection. And this is the climate you guys are called into. However, we can be encouraged to be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. You know, to be a part of the problem is uh, I either, one, you know, don't seek to walk as Jesus walked, um, or two, I basically just talk about this so much that I'm not even pointing to Jesus anymore. It becomes like a self-pity party. We're here to be a part of the solution in just holding up Jesus, holding up his word, teaching and discipling people in this element even, but we're so busy just lifting up the Lord and that we're just letting the Holy Spirit do his work. In a day like today, we're called to be a part of the solution, not part of the problem. Some pastors get up and I mean, and they're just, they're, how often do y'all, y'all even hear me talk like this? Next to never, Right? But there are some that they could be a part of, think they're being a part of the solution, but they're actually being a part of the problem because all they're doing is making a monument out of this issue. The church has a lot of issues. This is just one of many. But this is the climate you're called into today. So one, seven points. Know your Bible. Know your Bible because to know your Bible is to know the Lord's heart. Know the scriptures. And again, as you guys hear this, this is how you can pray for us. But also, this is the charge for you guys, because all of the points for them up here today and the points for us as pastors, this is what we're teaching you guys to do. So one, know your Bible. To know your Bible is to know the Lord's heart. 1 Samuel 13, 14 said that David was a man after God's own heart. He didn't just want the theology. He didn't just want the Bible trivia. He didn't just want to know what hermeneutics meant and eschatology and church history. He wanted to know his heart. Behind every word of God, there is a pulse. It is the pulse of heaven. It's the pulse of eternity. It's the heart of God. It's a heart that's so amazing that while his heart is omnipotent, he actually has put himself in a place where we can hurt him. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. It means don't make them sorrowful. We actually can hurt the heart of God. To know the Bible is to know the heart of God. Psalm 23, David said, God, when I think of God, he's a shepherd. He makes me lay down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Yeah, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because he's always with me. His rod and staff, they comfort me. No wonder David was so beautiful in how he treated people. Even though he had his fall and his failure, even in his repentance, David was a man after God's own heart. I mean, he was a perfect man, but he, was after, he understood that there was a heart behind all of the theology. So know your Bible and know the heart of God. As you know, however you perceive God to be is how you're going to treat people. There are some pastors that they fall in the trap of seeing God as a giant bottom line. It's just, just kind of like, what's the end result? Is, was the job done or not done? And people are just a means to an end. That's how they feel, see that God thinks of them as pastors, right? Uh, just based on how they perform. So then they're going to treat people based on how they perform. You see what I'm saying? You're going to treat people literally according to how you believe God is. How you believe God is and how you believe God treats you is how you're going to treat people. And this is a lifelong journey. 
Are you guys understanding this? You've got to know the word of God because you're going to treat people according to how you believe God is. And when you fall short and you will, you'll get convicted quicker because, oh, you know what? That's not the heart of God. That's not the way my Lord treats me. So one, know your Bible, know the Lord's heart. That's one, right? Two, know your election and know your identity. John 15, 16, Jesus said, you have not chosen me, he said to his followers. He said, but I've chosen you, and I've ordained you that you would go out and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. We've been chosen by God. Know your identity, know your election, know that God has picked you. Know your identity in him, not in performance. You may start ministries, and some of them may explode to the hundreds. Some of them may have two people, uh, and one's calling in by speakerphone. You know what I mean? Which is like one and a half people. But you see, when you know your identity, that doesn't define who you are. When you know who you are in Christ, when you know how you are loved of him and chosen of him, and the same applies to you, the church is going through an identity crisis. No wonder people uh, have such a battle with church versus some other fun activity on Sunday because they don't know what their identity is. They don't know if their identity is, uh, you know, well, part-time Christian, but part-time person trying to be happy in this world, part-time Christian, part-time, you know, uh, this, that, or a third. All of us have callings and occupations, but our election and our identity is in Christ. Always know that. Daniel chapter 9, verse 21 I love that because here's a teenage boy taken as a Jewish captive to Babylon. His name was changed, his culture. They attempted to erase his culture, his name, his family, his lineage, and now have him in a Chaldean school uh, similar to what you'd read of in a Harry Potter book, right, under Nebuchadnezzar. But it still tells us in Daniel 9, verse 21, even after being there for decades, He says that he was praying and God answered his prayer at the time of the evening oblation. You're like, evening oblation? The temple had been destroyed for decades. Back in Jerusalem, the temple had been destroyed. There wasn't any sacrifice going up uh, at all. There was no one, nothing was happening. There was no religious worship in Jerusalem. But in his heart, he's still on God's clock. It's the evening oblation. That means that even in Babylon, he could look at the clock and say, oh, three o'clock, evening oblation. Decades after being in a place and a culture that was attempting to mute him and to completely strip him of all of his identity. You want to be like a Daniel. You want to know your identity. To you guys today, you have to know your identity. Do you know your identity? That whether the job works or doesn't work, whether the promotion comes or doesn't come, whether you're fired, displaced, what people knew you as, and you go from insta-famous to uh, insta-nothing, do you know your identity? Are you resting in your identity in Christ? Because much of the depression out there today and the anxiety and a lot of it, and there is, of course, biological explanation for, for many maladies, but a lot of it today is actually due to people not knowing their identity. People in the world not yet coming to a saving knowledge of Christ and people in the church not resting in who they are and meditating in who they are. They become leaves blown in the wind. So one, know your Bible and know the Lord's heart. Two, know your election and know your identity. Three, know your calling. Jeremiah chapter one, verse five, he tells Jeremiah, before you were even in your mother's womb, I already picked you to be a prophet. I looked both of you guys in the eye, and I said, do you believe? Doesn't matter what I believe. Doesn't matter what Pastor Sherman believes. Do you believe that you're called by God to pastor the church of the the living God? And you both looked at me and said, I know it. That is something that you must know. That is a calling. That is something where Paul said, I I, I conferred not with flesh and blood. When God revealed his son to me, Galatians 1, I didn't need to run and get 100 attaboys, and by the strength of the pats on the back, I would know if I was really called or not. It's something you know. You have to know your calling. Because here's the reality. There are people that you're going to be talking to that are going to know more Bible than you. There are people you're going to be talking to who are going to be able to quote more Bible than you. There are people you're going to be talking to who have done more outreaches than you. But the difference between them and you is that you've been called, according to grace, 
you've been called to be a pastor. You're going to have many that are going to try to say, you know, well, everyone's pastors. Everyone's a minister. And that's not true. Everyone does ministry. But if you read Ephesians chapter 4, it says that God gave four offices for the church to build the church. The evangelist, the prophet, the apostle, and the pastor teacher. Some think it's the pastor and the teacher, but the Granville Sharps rule in the Greek grammar says that whenever you have two words in the same case linked by the word and, it's one and the same thing, and the second word highlights the first. So it's the pastor teacher, meaning that the pastor's primary job is to teach. And that's what you guys have to know, and that's what you guys have to know. Because a lot of people think that your job is to be at all their birthday parties and be their buddy. And if you do show up to their party to be their buddy, they don't understand that that's the exception and not the rule. Your job is to teach. Our job is to teach you the word of God. And church is the primary place where we do it. Some people will miss church, but they want to text you Bible questions. But they don't come to church when you've been prepping and teaching and discipling and discipleship class, but they want to text you and then get mad when you don't answer back. But this is where the main place where it goes on. I mean, I wonder what they did in the early church. There was no texting. What would you do? <laughs> you had to go to synagogue. You had to go to church. So you guys understand your calling. It says in 1 Timothy 4.12, let no one despise your youth. People are going to despise your youth. My wife, they'll tell you stories. People will come along, and, and we've had it here, you know. I'm going on 48 now, but I mean, some say, I, you know, I don't know how old I look. You know what I mean? I mean, at 2 a.m., I feel like 99 years old. But anyway, some people come in here over the years when we first started, and you could tell by the way they're looking at me after the end of the message. They start off by saying, young man, young man, good service today. <laughs> but I, man, I recommend this, that, and a third. What are they doing? They're despising your youth. Paul told Timothy, let no one despise your youth. What it means is because you're younger, count your calling as lesser value, right? Let no one despise your youth. And then John 1 verse 42, knowing that Jesus called Peter, it says in John 1 42, he looked at Peter, but the Greek word is that he looked through him. He saw all of Peter's denials he saw all of Peter speaking out of turn. He saw everything about Peter, the Greek word, John 1, and Jesus looked upon him. He looked through him, and he said, you are Cephas. You are Simon, rather, but when you're, I'm done with you, you will be Cephas. You will be a stone. He says, basically, I'm calling you as you are, but just remember that while he was doing a work through Peter, he was also doing a work in Peter. While he's going to do a work through you, he's also doing a work in you. And it's he that is doing that work. But you've got to know your calling. I want to read 1 Peter chapter 5. And I hope you guys are writing these down as well because what happens is this ends up being a day where we've all grown as a church. We've all grown in our love of ecclesiology. What is ecclesiology? The study of the church and of how the church should behave. And you're like, wait a minute, but really, how, how important is that? Well, there's entire books of the Bible dedicated to this, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, right? Um, so 1 Peter chapter 5, it says in verse 2, feed the flock of God, which is among you. That's our job. Our job is to feed them, right? Feed the flock of God taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not sucking your teeth when you do it, not where you just look like, you know, uh, you know, or ready to smite the rock like Moses, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, meaning not uh, with an ulterior motive just to make money and fleece the flock, but with a ready mind. Neither, verse 3, as being lords over God's heritage, not power tripping, not acting like just because the Lord has put you in that position, you don't lord your position over anyone. We use our position to serve. Jesus washed feet, and he even washed Judas' feet. Be an example to the flock. And then verse 4, but this came later with other points. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that fades not away. You're going to get a crown for this. There's a specific crown that Jesus has just for pastors. There is a specific crown that Jesus has just for pastors. You see this here? This is the shepherd's crown. Not only do we get to do this and we don't even deserve it, not only do we get to do it and it's like the longer you do it, you realize just how inadequate you are. Uh, you realize more and more just how much blood Jesus had to shed for you to be allowed to do it. But when it's all over, you're going to get a crown for this. 
All right? So, one, know your Bible so you can know the Lord's heart. Two, know your election, know your identity. Hey, church, are y'all, are y'all, y'all, are y'all writing this down too? You think it's just for them? Because you know we live in a day where everybody is all watching the pastor. Pastor, you know your identity, but you don't even know your identity. Pastor, you in that word? You working on that message? Are you coming to church? Do you even know if I did it or not? <laughs> you know? Make sure that you know it. Make sure that you're standing in these things. Do you know your calling? Do you know your calling? If your calling is to be a stay-at-home mom, are you praising God that you're a stay-at-home mom and you know that that is a calling? Tough calling, no, right? Watching Sesame Street reruns all day, trying, wishing your child would want to listen to some apologetics. I don't know what it is or whatever, you know, but my point is, you know, do you know your calling? Your calling at that job. And, oh, man, you done applied to 800 different jobs and 801 rejected you but you know that your calling is to that place and that God has a plan for your life. Are y'all, this is for y'all too, just as much as them. You've got to know your Bible so you can know God's heart. You've got to know your election and your identity. Know your calling. And then fourth, this is for you guys, fourth point, know the sheep. Shepherds should smell like sheep. People in auto shops should smell like auto grease and oil. Shepherds should smell like sheep. The problem today is we have too many shepherds uh, that do not smell like sheep. We are called to teach, but we're called to teach among the sheep, not above them, uh, not in some untouchable, inaccessible place. We should smell like sheep. It says in Proverbs 27, 23, it says, give all diligence to know the affairs of your flock. What does that mean? It means sometimes at 2, 3 in the morning, you're just awake. And what are you doing? You're just thinking of who you haven't seen in a while how they're doing, and when you see that person, hey, you know, been seeing you around a lot, you know, what, what do you do? What's about you? Like, talk to me, you know, what are you going through? You're asking the Lord, Lord, where, where, where's the American church today? Okay, how do we as a local church stand uh, in that, and where do we need to change, and what tides are going on, and what's happening, and then the Lord will even give you insight beforehand, you know, we're like level up. You're implementing things even before it's called a national crisis, even before it's called a city crisis. It's by knowing, it's spending time and letting God speak to you about what his church needs and how everyone out here is doing. You know, you know, I, you know what? I think everyone just needs to pick me up. You know, we're going to just have a meal. You know what? I think that a lot of people are just really have their antenna crossed with this COVID thing. You know what? We're not going to put, we're going to challenge people to come to church, but we're not going to guilt trip the people that haven't come back yet. That this comes from spending time knowing the state of the flock. Too many pastors fall in the trap of just winging it, and then it's all about a bottom line. Well, I, well the people aren't here. That's the bottom line. And it's Proverbs 4, 7. It says, always seek to get understanding. So know the state of your sheep. Know the state of your sheep. Pull out your phone and just scroll through your phone and just look for names of just who you haven't seen in a while. Send out texts. I mean, that's the beauty of unlimited texting. You just check on folk. Let them know they're loved, you know. Uh, reach out to people. Always seek to know the state of your sheep, you know. Um, after service, you watch. That what do we do after service? We mingle. We stick around. We're out here. We could have meetings after church. You know, for those who ever wonder, well, Andy, how can you have meetings? Are you having meetings? Well, one, we have meetings, obviously. Uh, with the amount of people we serve, uh, the fact that the lights are on and the heat is on and we still got burgers in the freezer, we obviously have a lot of meetings because we're serving hundreds of people uh, from here and even in other parts of the world who have nothing. And in two blinks, if you don't watch things correctly, your account will be dried up. You ever have a family member come in and move in with you? Just one family member. And what it did to your grocery bill? And, and all of a sudden, you realize you're, 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 you're insufficient funds just because Cousin Joey? You, but you thought, you th yeah. Well, imagine hundreds of Cousin Joeys. So my point is, yes, we could have meetings after service, but our, we want to know, use that time to know the state of the flock. We stick around. We hang around. That's how you get to know the state of the flock. So know the sheep. Hebrews 13, 17 says that we're to watch for their souls. Look, the reality is there's some people out here that work harder than us. They work longer hours than us, some people out here. They do. They work longer hours. Uh, some out here have two jobs. Uh, they're on three, four hours sleep a night, you know. Um, 
To say that our job is hard is not saying that uh, it is physically the hardest. But when you add in the spiritual component of watching people's souls, that is what they say shortens a pastor's lifespan. Because we don't have the privilege of saying good riddance because you're watching for that soul. Even Samuel wouldn't stop praying for Saul when he got filled with demons and became, went from being a king to, to actually an assassin. We're not able to say, well, that person's crazy. In, in other realms and other professions, they can do that. We're not, we're, our, the Holy Spirit doesn't allow us to turn that switch off. So we ache for people. We ache for people that leave. We ache for everything. You're watching for people's souls. But remember this, this is what Jesus is in the middle of doing. So always realize that when you're feeling this way and that tiredness that even comes, you see why Jesus could sleep on a boat in the middle of a storm? That, that wears you down in a way like nothing else. But while you're burning away, you're giving more light. It's a paradox. While you're burning away, you're actually getting more invigorated. It's the, it, it, to the natural mind, it doesn't make sense how you can be wearing away, but at the same time feeling more alive than ever. Jesus said, if you seek to preserve your life, you're going to lose it. But if you give away your life for my sake and the gospel, you're going to find it. it. Dive into that soul taxing yet soul resurrecting paradox. That's why I believe pastors that really get this, they get sweeter as the job goes on. Not more morose, not more melancholy, not more, uh, you know, pessimistic. They get sweeter if they're on the right track, if they're doing it God's way. So know the sheep, watch for their souls, let it wear you down, but also look forward to as death worketh in you, the life of Christ, the resurrection power works more in you. Amen. Are y'all, are y'all understanding this more? Do you feel like after today, you're going to come away and kind of realize more like, Man, God says an awful lot about this thing that we celebrate every first day of the week and what goes on throughout the week, yeah? Right? Does the church not talk about this enough? This is called ecclesiology. And because so many don't have a solid ecclesiology, here they are thinking that everyone else in the church is the problem, but the problem is they have a poor ecclesiology. And if they were to sit down to a written test, they'd probably be really embarrassed with what their grade would be uh, when it came back to them. But we have the scriptures, amen? And Jesus is at the door knocking. So lastly, well, we have three more. So one, know the Bible, know the Lord's heart. Two, know your election, know your identity. Three, know your calling. Four, know the sheep. And may I just add to knowing the sheep is, yo, some sheep are going to hurt you. There are going to be some sheep, and my wife will tell you, there are people that I literally laid my life down for, meaning they would even tell you out of their own mouth, if he did not do what he did, I would have died, and he could have died doing what he did to rescue me. And then turn around and slander you, and you're only as good as whatever the last thing they heard about you. People are going to hurt you. And then it's going to hurt y'all even more because y'all wives are going to be like, oh, really? And, and I was home watching reruns, allowing him to be out to do that. And then, then y'all going to say something like, yo, sweetheart, it's all good. Jesus is worth it. Then it's going to make y'all even more mad because you're like, man, he's handling it like such a champ. And he's wanting it. Now I'm even more angry. So you have to understand with y'all the importance of understanding all of this. But yeah, we do live in a day where... If people treat Jesus uh, like a slot machine, is it any wonder that we're going to get treated like a slot machine? If people, and as long as you keep that perspective, it keeps you out of the trap, and you will get tempted to feel the self-pity and all the self-stuff. But in a day where Jesus is treated this way, Jesus said, no servant is above his master. How they treat me is how they're going to treat you. If they treat Jesus like, hey, I'm just coming for blessings. I'm just coming to get, not to give. Uh, then understand that you're in the best company in the universe as people just come to you only when they want something. But again, come back to this, knowing the Lord's heart. The church is a dysfunctional family. But guess what? It's the best dysfunctional family in the universe. And it's the only dysfunctional family with answers for their dysfunction. Amen? And the power to have the victory over the dysfunction. That's what separates the church family from every other group and every other org, okay? Now, the next one is, and this falls under sheep, is knowing their hearts. The Bible says the hearts are desperately wicked. So when people do things that are some of the ugliest things done in the Bible, 
realize that the Bible just told you that people are going to do these things. Already in the early church, you had a man named Diotrephes. He wanted to shine so much that he wasn't even letting the apostle John come into the church house. Already you had divisions. Already in the early church, as soon as there were people, you had people having ulterior motives. In Acts chapter 20, Paul said, after I leave, people are going to come in and try to draw people away from you, cause divisions, and start their own ministries that aren't of God, but start their own ministries by pilfering off what you have. That happened in Acts chapter 20. So one, know people's hearts. But what keeps you from getting discouraged? What keeps you from feeling like Moses when he smote the rock? Know your own heart. As long as you realize you're the biggest sinner you know, no one's sin will ever make you say, how could they? As long as you know how bad your breath smells in the morning, how bad your breath smells in the morning, you'll never find yourself saying, how could that person have such bad breath? Because you'll realize that you're just a sinner among sinners. So six is know your own heart. So again, one, know the Bible, know the Lord's heart. Two, know your election, know your identity. Three, know your calling. Four, know the sheep. Five, know their hearts, that they're desperately wicked, but that the Lord loves them and has given his life for them. And you show your love for Jesus by how you feed them, how you shepherd them, and even how you take knots and bumps from them. Similar to a mom. A mom will have bite marks on her, scratches. You know, it's like, wait, you've been in a fight? Nah, baby just clawed my, you know, daughter just clawed my face. You know what I mean? We show our love for the Lord and for the body, not just by how we teach, but even how we take the, take the hits, you know? But then point six is know your own heart. As long as you know your own heart, you will not fall in that trap. And a lot of pastors fall in that trap. You know, it's, they just get in the pulpit and their hearts have reached a place where they just start beating the body up. They're be, it's just how could you come on, get with it. It's, it's a whole different thing. And here's one thing to always remember. Sheep don't like to be driven. You never go see a shepherd standing behind sheep, screaming at them what direction to go. Sheep like to be led, not driven. A lot of ministries today are trying to drive sheep, and that's not God's likeness to sheep. That's not the way we respond. We like to be led, so we lead by example. If we want to see the church go deeper, we go deeper. If we want to see the church take up a better attitude and posture toward the unlovely and toward the world, we do that. You know, we lead by example, and then you find people follow, right? Because here, our leadership believes in getting dirty. That's why an event like Friday, we can have 40 volunteers, and we didn't even have a sign-up list. 40 volunteers ready to come serve hundreds of the city's gangbangers and youth and high-risk youth with no sign-up sheet because sheep will, they like being led. They just don't like being driven, you know? So we don't tell them where to be and where to go. We go there, right? And then lastly is know the gospel. <laughs> know the gospel. Know the gospel and may your lingua franca toward everyone and toward your own heart even be the gospel of Jesus Christ. The longer you do this, the more inept you're going to feel, the more inadequate you're going to feel. But that's the same thing Paul said. Right before Paul got beheaded, he said he was the chief of sinners. It's like, wait a minute, Paul, you're saying you have like a secret life we don't know about? No, the longer you do this and the more you understand the gospel, the more you realize how unworthy you are. So lastly is knowing the gospel. And you guys, how well do you know the gospel? There's that ministry God's calling you to. Do you understand the gospel? Are you being your own worst enemy? God's forgiven you. How many of you out here today, there's something you haven't forgiven yourself for? That comes from not understanding the gospel. Are you understanding the gospel? Are you knowing the gospel? Are you making your life work to know the gospel? You know, you can share your testimony, but you just can't share on this one place. Have you invited the gospel into that place? Have you invited in the fact that Christ's blood brings forgiveness and healing and that that person, you know, has been crucified with Christ and that every test brings a testimony and every mess brings a message? Are you applying the gospel to every area of your life or is it just to the easy areas and you leave the, the hard areas locked up in a closet and you lock it so good you even lock it away from God? The gospel, you've got to know the gospel. And by you being gospel-saturated, 
pastors, those that come near you will have an encounter with the gospel. They'll find themselves meditating and going deeper on the gospel, you know? So I thought at this point that we would just let my wife come in and say something. How many of y'all want to hear a word, you know, from this lady? I like that look she gives me. It's like, but she knew it was coming. So you took the ladies out, you know, and, and what, are, what are some things that, that you just shared in brief, you know, and then we're going to actually lay hands on you guys and do this right. Are you guys enjoying this today? Now, we could have, we could have ordered some barbecue and the six of us and the elders gone in the back room, done it, eating pulled pork sandwiches and coleslaw. Then ne next week, tell y'all, yo, this happened and put a picture on the screen. But would you have understood so much of what the scripture says? Would you appreciate the office as much as you appreciate it? Oh, see, right? So, Tasha, I know, you, and that was your idea to take them out. I didn't say, hey, Tosh, take them out. You, you took them out. What happened? We had a great time. We had good food. I oh, know, I always do that. We had good food, for, uh, number one. Um, we really just talked about, uh, you know, what they were concerned about as go, stepping into ministry and watching their, their husbands take on this role. Um, and um, we talked about like what, what it's like on, to be a supportive wife to a husband in ministry and um, some of the things that I've experienced uh, as a pastor's wife, which was you know really, I think we, that was the best part of our conversation. Um, and you know, I just really wanted to encourage them that it's, you know, it's it's uh, it's a journey, and they will grow through this, and there will be moments where, um, you know, they might might feel like, uh, you know, uncertainty, but that God's always with them, and and God will really bless them for their service, and that being a pastor's wife is also an act of service, and as well. So, can't really. What else do we? <laughs> and we just hung out. Yeah, it was good. It and was live a good life time. together. Yeah. Amen. I'm Pastor Sherm. Sherm, anything on your heart, brother? I know there is. Good morning. Well, I just definitely wanted to say that over the last few years, I've just had a great time working alongside these two gentlemen and their wives and just seeing them grow, seeing their gifts, seeing them just grow amongst the congregation and just see how the Lord has blessed them. And then having a bird's eye view into their life, personal things going on and just how they just clung closer to the Lord, closer to the church through it. So it's just a blessing. I can't wait to lay hands on these brothers. And it's just, uh, it's just confirmation of what the Lord's already done in their lives, that their calling is sure. And I second it uh, definitely. So I love these guys. I love their wives. And they're just a great addition to the fellowship and the leadership. And what would you say, what's pastoring done for you? Well, it certainly uh, caused me to really look at myself and really cling to the gospel because every day I see more and more of my failings. And working alongside Pastor Aaron has taught me to love the flock uh, in a completely new way that I never imagined. Uh, working with young people through Level Up has completely changed my life. I just love the children, the young people, in a way that I didn't before. I was kind of like hands off with young people, but now I can't wait to see them. I miss them when they're not here. I feel like I'm the uncle and dad to a lot of them and the granddad to some of them. And it just changes your heart. It melts you. It causes you to confront some of your own biases, some of your own issues. Uh, and the Lord just grows you up through it. So it's matured me in the faith. Uh, and it showed me that the, the gospel is real, and uh, it shows me how to forgive, how to love, um, and how to forgive myself on some issues that I had. So uh, it, it's, it's been an a awesome journey. Uh, I got ordained five years ago, almost to the day. Uh, I was hey, thinking man, about that man. this morning. <laughs> uh, so it's just been a blessing, and I can't wait to see the same things continue in these guys' life. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. And as you guys know, Sherman and I are very big on living life together. And, and, you know, I just look at them sometimes and I just ask them, like, you know, are you still having fun? And because we got to have fun. There's going to be times where we don't have fun, yeah. you know. Um, so we're going to lay hands on you guys. I thought it would also be sweet for people just to hear just 
your name, your social security number, your date of birth, your blood type. But if you could just share just a minute of who you are, Jared is going to be our pastor, and this is going to mean growth in some beautiful ways here at the church. Jared will be the head of discipleship and Bible teaching and training, and you guys have all seen that in his life. Yes, amen? Amen. All right. Eric will be the head of hospitality, uh, of the sick and shut-in, for those who are just there, and man, I'm just, who's visiting me, and you know, I'm at down for the count, um, and missions. As you know, we have missionaries currently in different parts of the world, you know, but um, if you could just share with them just briefly, maybe, you know, who you are and how you feel. Uh, I'm sure. I mean, then people can kind of see you a little more, you know. Hello. Uh, I'm Jared. Um, I go to Antioch Christian Fellowship. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm just really looking forward to this next phase of ministry. Um, I kept thinking, what would I say when I come up here? Well, I, I go to Antioch. You, you know, I came here as a sheep, just uh, learning under Pastor Aaron. I've learned so much. Um, I'm so privileged to be here. The work that's being done here is just, I, I can't think of any other place I want to be. Um, it's just, I, I can't think of it. And I'm just looking forward to just being helping you on your journey. Um, what Pastor Aaron said as far as being head of Bible teaching and Bible um, and discipleship, it gives me an opportunity to grow. There's so much I don't know, but I also look forward to helping other people grow in that area as well. So I'm just ready to go. Where do you work? In? Oh, so I currently work at Lancaster Bible College as a staff accountant. Um, at some point, I may not stay at a, as a staff accountant there, but right now I am. Um, it's been a wonderful wonderful opportunity for me just to even be around um, pastors and teachers and professors. So I actually get to go to a Bible college five days of the week that will help support what I do here. And how many years have you been an accountant? Oh, goodness. I've been an accountant for, let's see, how was that? Goodness, so bad counting. Um, a long time. It's been about, about, about five or six years now. Okay, awesome. Well, praise God. And his wonderful wife, Cassie. Come on, Cassie. Oh, yeah, we want to hear from you, sis. So this is... Can they hear you? Yeah. So this is really special. I feel like I grew up here, came here when I was like 22, and, you know, was not really trying to serve at all. I was really just... I'm I'm still shy, but I've, you know, I've expanded my um, um, comfort zone. You know, um, and it's just really special because I feel like I've learned so much. Um, like Pastor Sherman was saying about the gospel, about just enjoying reading the Bible. So um, it's just a blessing to just serve more because this is like where I grew up in the Lord. And so it's really special for that reason. Amen. And where do you work? And what do you I'm do? a teacher. Um, I teach third grade and I work in the city of Wilmington. Awesome. Awesome. Praise God. Seriously. Let's go, Eric, and then we're going to have Annie share as well. Good morning, everyone. Um, I've been going to Antioch for about nine years now, and uh, I work for Goya, the food company. I've been there about 15 years, and then Annie and I work together at a funeral home as well. So we you know, do that a little bit as well. <laughs> um, well a little bit. Tell them what you do there. You... No, you don't want to know that. <laughs> 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 um, you know... Funeral is, is very morbid to people, obviously, because, you know, death and everything. But I'm the one getting my hands dirty. I'm doing pickups. I'm dressing people. I'm getting people ready. Annie's doing the makeup on people. So, yeah, we're just very hands-on in that, that department. So. <laughs> um, but uh, I love sales. Uh, I grew up in a, in a corner store, Bodega, since 11 years old. So I'm really in the business side. I love financial side. Um, and then just having, been able to work for Goya for so long and seeing what's going on in that world of, of sales and, 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 uh, and being a broker uh, to many uh, different uh, customers and, and stores and stuff like that, it's really great. So I've gone to grow and mature over that. And then uh, coming here in Antioch, seeing the maturity at a different level, being saved late in life, and just getting to know the church more, getting to know the leadership more on a more intimate level and just hanging out with, with the leadership and, and with all y'all here. It's just 
preparing me for, for this time and this journey that, that we're about to go through. Um, I never thought this door would open for me, but the Lord opened it, and I'm blessed to have it. I'm blessed to share it with Jared and, and his wife, Cassie. And uh, it's a journey that we're going to go through together. It's going to be ups. It's going to be downs, like Pastor said. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to, to serving you all and serving the community and uh, just making Antioch a better place for everybody. Amen. Amen. Now, how many of you guys remember when I would have him come up and share about sports? <laughs> how many of you started saying, like, why is he doing that in church? Like, there's no place for that and whatever, whatever. Uh, while contributing to the family element, what I was actually doing was taking someone who I saw as very wonderful and sensing a calling on his life, it was a creative way for you to get to know who he was because that is his thing. Now, how many of you know this man and have come to know him more through that? And his public speaking uh, talent and gifting really took off with that, which he already had. So it was all a plan of saying, hey, look at what we're doing here, and that's what we're about here is raising leaders up, you know? And he even raises us up in the context that we like, you know, sports. I mean, he's a Michigan fan, but whatever, you know? <laughs> but, but Annie, would you come up and share now? You tell the church how you spent hours on your knees. <laughs> Good morning, church. Uh, my name is Annie Pena, or Anielka Pena, but a lot of people can't pronounce it, so they call me Annie. Um, I've been coming to Antioch for about 10 years, and um, there, like Pastor was sharing, yes, God had given me a vision that Eric was going to be a pastor, but I was newly saved, so I didn't know exactly what that meant. So I thought it was me because I have very wild imagination, so I just thought it was just me imagining that. But at the same time, I felt like the Lord was pressing my heart to continue to pray for him not knowing what that would look like. And probably five years later, God confirmed it through Pastor Aaron without me even saying anything to him, which at that moment was like, oh, now I know what that meant. So I even prayed, you know, even more fiercely for, for him and for us as well as a family because it's a, it's a you know, a ministry that comes within a family. Um, so coming here to Antioch, um, just like Cassie, I was very shy, um, but I knew God was calling me into this church. Um, and just the way he was calling me, it was just the confirmation to know that God had something special for us as a family. And to even be, you know, united with Natasha and Pastor Aaron in such a way that I didn't think it was going to be, you know, this much of a blessing. Um, but God, you know, he's good and he's just been providing in so many ways, and we're just grateful. We're excited to see what God has for us down the future. So we're just going to be more on our knees more now, now that we're here, um, and just waiting for God to do only what he can do. Amen, amen, amen. You know I like putting people on the spot. Can my daughter Annie come up? Now, you guys have children, right? And then there's the whole thing, well, ministry with kids. You know, my kids have never known a normal weekend. Um, we started this 20 years ago, and every weekend when everyone else is having fun, that's when we really go to work the hardest. So we have a lot of fun, but we don't, we've never had a normal weekend. They don't know what a normal American weekend is, if you will. You know, we go away, maybe two weekends of the year they get to experience that. But they just don't know what it's like to be up all night on a Saturday, sleeping together on a Sunday, brunch, or decide, you know, anything, you know. Uh, but, you know, Annie's seen a lot. Annie's seen the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, they say PKs are known for being wild. Uh, my family, by God's grace, we, we kick that stereotype to the curb. Doesn't mean that we're perfect. But uh, the, by, when you just hold up the grace of God and the gospel and have the right perspective, your kids will be better for it. So I just, would you share with them, my baby, good morning, how you doing? Would you share with them just being a PK and for their, them and ministry and busyness and their children? Yeah. Can y'all hear me okay? Ooh, okay. Also, I have my Invisalign in, so I'm sorry if I have a list, but I'm gonna try to get over that. Um, but I think, you know, being a PK, it definitely has taught me to cling to God more. Um, and I know even when you guys came over, we talked a lot about like how um, taking on this role would really impact your entire family, you know, uh, your wife, your children. Um, it definitely, it definitely does. You see a lot, 
uh, you learn a lot. I've I've watched uh, my mom and dad, especially my dad, go through so much, um, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. Um, but God has been there with us through every step of the way. Um, and you'll see that too, you know. Um, he really does honor when you serve him. Um, he really does. So we've had so many great experiences just from this, just from, you know, from seeing him in, in leadership. There's just so many. There's such a reward to that. So, yeah. Would your walk be the way it is if I weren't a pastor? No, no, it, I, it definitely wouldn't. Um, just like I said, like it really has brought me so much closer to God just from seeing how he clings to God even. I, I watch his walk with God, and that makes me want to get even closer with him. So, Amen. So it actually, and we celebrate all the time. We're, our family is blessed, because, not in spite of, because of what we do. We, are, we count regularly. What, if we say take away church, take away pastoring, and we sometimes just do the math on how many things would not be in our life. No Alaska, right? No Haiti. I mean, we just go, then start listing the people. If we weren't pastoring, I mean, we would realize we would be poor. Um, just for us and our family, because of what he's brought into our lives, we would miss all those things that we've, that we've received. So God will bless you when he comes, but he will bless you now. And he'll make even, right? He'll make even 10 minutes of laughing the equivalent of a full weekend, just 10 minutes of just laughing, just in a car driving to get something worth a whole weekend together or a whole weekend at a theme park. He will just supernaturally increase that time, you know? And one thing is we laugh a lot, and you have to just laugh being nuts. Are we nuts? Crazy. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> yeah, so, so praise God, you know? So uh, thank you, sweetheart. All right, yeah, yeah, I was there, right on the spot. So... Just to share this with you guys, and we're going to lay hands on them now, and then we're going to close. You know, um, are you, did you guys appreciate this today? Do you feel you really grew and learned? <laughs> 20 years ago, <clears throat> I was on my way to medical school. I uh, went to University of Pennsylvania, biological basis of behavior, neural systems, worked at Wistar Institute for a renowned um, researcher, uh, his recommendations alone were known to just get you into medical school. Uh, Dr. Meenard Herlin, a uh, German scientist. Uh, I would train uh, PhDs. I would train grad students and undergrads in lab protocol. And they couldn't even, to even move to graduation, they had to come to Wistar for me to train them. You know, Wistar is one of the oldest research institutions. It's right here at Penn, uh, right on par with NIH. So I got radically saved. Didn't like God, didn't like the Bible, didn't want any part of it. Um, you know, um, was into just all my own forms of spirituality, but I had no answer for this hole in my heart, no answer for how to just clean and guilt. I had no answers for these things that were eating me alive in this giant void. Got radically saved, and then just because you get radically saved doesn't mean you don't go to med school. God needs people out there in that field too, but he called me a week after being saved to be a pastor. So my family thought I was crazy because I went to them and said, hey, I'm not going to medical school. I'm marrying Natasha, um, even though I have another year of college, because um, we're going to make this right in God's eyes. Uh, and he's calling me to go into ministry, and no, I'm, I don't think I'm going to seminary. So my family and one of my uncles had a position waiting for me as a partner, as one of the most noted oncologists in northern New Jersey. All I did was go to any medical school, partner. Rock out. That was it. So you can imagine when I brought that news, it was like, it was like he's on crack. <laughs> he's on crack, you know? Uh, you can imagine what the phone calls for years. I was told to keep my hobbies to the side, told to, you know, I hope your storefront church does well, and all these different things, you know? And we started with three people in our living room. And this woman actually didn't even get the first two years of teaching because she would come home from the law firm, take everyone's babies up to our living room, right around the corner at 48th and Larchwood, and watch everyone's kids while nursing Annie with one arm, still in her suit from the law firm. Two years without hearing my teaching. So Quana and those here today who got discipled in that, she missed that whole area of discipleship. So the sisters out there that think it's tough, there's always someone you can glean from. Uh, when Think of throwing in the towel. Um, there's always sisters you can glean from who could really tell you the reward and the sacrifices that Jesus is worth, you know? From three people in our living room, it grew to 30 people in our living room. 
Uh, it became a triage unit. We had people coming with bandages so they wouldn't shoot heroin, Muslims in full garb, uh, religious debates, getting screamed at, having to put people out the house because they're going to wake up my daughter, our house getting robbed, um, crack addicts coming to get served from our door 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., my wife calling me when I'm out of state because someone's kicking the door and she's upstairs showering for a meeting so she's showering with a razor in her hand because she didn't know if the person was going to try to come in but she had to go somewhere out the back door. I could go on with the stories, threats, you name it, but our mission was always just to show this city um, the best version of Jesus we could. We started frying fish on street corners, we then went to a rat infested thrift store around the corner. We had no money. Whenever we had money we gave it away. And then we were told this building was for sale. The banker said, you're going to need $300,000 to put down. And I remember thinking in my mind, like, you might as well enjoy this free meal with these bankers because you don't have the money and you'll never see them again. So just enjoy the steak. We are at Sabrina's on 9th and Christian. Just eat the steak, Aaron. Just eat it up and <laughs> praise God. I was already starting to think what I was going to do with the rest of the day because, you know, no point in even taking their cell phone numbers. And then we started having prayer meetings, and someone showed up who never had been to the church before and said they wanted to speak to me privately and said they'd been traveling across the country to give an amount of money. And the person was like 29 years old. I'm thinking, oh, even if it's 10 bucks, praise God for her heart. She said it was $300,000, and she, the exact amount of money the banker said we needed. We bought this building. So this is a ministry... This is a ministry that's always operated in the miraculous. This is a ministry that is always, we're a mid-sized church that does mega church things. You know, we've done some of the largest outreach of events in the city. It's all by God's grace. We like doing big things. I refer to this church like a pit bull. Do you notice that when people have dogs out, no matter what dog they own and how big it is, when a pit bull comes out, everyone puts their dogs away? Do you know why? Three reasons. It has very little body fat. This isn't a mega church, but the people here work. Very little body fat in this church, okay? Low center of gravity. We get down and we get dirty. Three, whatever we bite, we don't let go of until the Lord tells us to stop. And that is the reason why everyone doesn't like pit bulls, why everyone respects the pit bull. Very little body fat, low center of gravity. Whatever it bites, it doesn't release until God says so, you know? That's what God is calling us into and I believe our best days are ahead of us, you know. Um, for many, COVID was uh, one of the worst church experiences. A lot of churches closed. Uh, COVID and 20 and 2021 were our best years financially ever uh, and our strongest years with Daily Bread drive through and everything else. I believe God's taken us to another level, and you guys are a major part in us going to another level, you know. And I would say that's been our key. Our key has always been we're never satisfied. We're satisfied, but we're not satisfied. We've seen enough that if we stop today, we could talk about the stories for a long time, you know, but we're not satisfied, right? Not at all. Yeah. And yo, you ever been tempted to quit? Mm -hmm. Keep it a bean. <laughs> you, ever, you ever daydream that I would quit? <laughs> yo, let me tell you, I got tempted to quit early on. I uh, started having heart problems and I'm 29 years old, already on blood pressure meds in cardiologist's office. Left side of my face is numb. I'm driving up Spruce Street, just saying to the Lord, Lord, I wanted a family all my life. Like, why are you going to let me have my two kids? They're so little, and then I'm going to die now. It would be better maybe if I didn't have kids, you know? And then I just thought of just walking away from ministry, you know? And the Lord brought the right person at the right time to speak life. They said, no, you don't need to quit. You just need four weeks off. I'm going to come teach for you in the thrift store. And the Lord used that prophetic person. God will always give you what you need. If your job is just to know your calling, he'll keep you. Amen? Amen. So you guys, we're going to lay hands on them now. And uh, I'm going to ask Tosh, you just put your hands on the ladies. And Sherm, you could throw your hand on Brother Pina. He's going to need it today because when he watches what Purdue does to Villanova, he's going to get <laughs> bitter. It's going to get really bitter. So we just, I need that, you know. And, um, you know, I just want to say, you guys, we have... Uh, Man, as a church, even Paul, to be a believer, you're going to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, even Paul, at his trial in Rome, he said, at my trial, no one showed up. The greatest evangelist of all time, who birthed and wrote the majority of the New Testament, 
On trial in Rome, he said, no one came to stand with me. I pray God has mercy on them. Yo, we're call- it's a tough calling, but it's the sweetest calling you can have. It is the sweetest calling in the world. So we invite you guys into the toughest yet most beautiful thing that you will ever know in your life. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Lord God, we just pray, and as a church, we bear witness, and we, Lord, agree with you in ordaining these men to the office of the pastorate, Lord. Lord, they line up with the qualifications of 1 Timothy 3. We thank you for their lives. And Lord, this is not us putting our hands on them, but this is us agreeing with what you're doing and as you have instituted the laying on of hands in the church. You said, lay hands on no man suddenly, but first prove all things. These men have been proven and we stand in agreement. So Lord, we uh, call them into the right hand of fellowship of the ministry of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as pastors in your kingdom. Lord, whatever you have for them, Assistant pastoring, planting churches around the world, doing things that makes Antioch seem like just a stepping stool. Lord, we are excited for all of what you will do because we don't deserve any of this. So we thank you. And it's in Jesus' mighty name the whole church says, Amen. Amen.